jars of warm winter regards to you ancient world people and thank you for tuning in to this week's piece of the week which is going to be discussing scarabs scaraboids kepri the great dung beetle in the sky yeah one of the most quintessential ancient Egyptian symbols that, that is in popular culture still to this day. And part of the reason for doing this video is, well, for over 20 years I've been really, really annoyed at the bad rap they've had since the movie The Mummy with Brendan Fraser and... What's her name? Metal Vice. Miss Weissman. Idle Vice. Vanilla Rice. Rachel Wise. Yeah, that one in that knocked the library over. What a disgrace. But anyway, that movie destroyed the reputation of the Scarab. And for something so gentle and benign, it was turned into a rampaging, foraging, racing after humans, just running after them and eating them alive well it does eat flesh technically as well as dung but going straight underneath their skin and eating their brains oh my god it's just it was ridiculous i was the only person in that movie i remember laughing at the screen i should have thrown my popcorn at it i mean other people were you know squirming i just thought it was an outrage how dare hollywood turn a beautiful little amulet a little creature into such a monster it's just not right and that's what I think this video should be about is readdressing that I mean it was an okay movie a, a poor man's Raiders of the Lost Ark perhaps but it certainly did some damage it gave Egypt a, a more spooky sinister flavor than it really should have had because yeah, I, I've had a first-hand account of scarabs in Australia here. They were imported into the country in the 1950s to break up the animal dung and reduce the fly plague that was going on at the time. So, I mean, that's part of the reason they say, well, we have a, a strange accent over here is we have to say things quickly. So, good day, sir, it becomes ghetto, so you don't let the flies in. Mm, it's not true but that's how how some people perceive it anyway when I was a teenager and I was building my little empire up in the mountains carving my heads and making the pyramids for my dead animals I used to witness these imported scarabs that had grown to quite a great number by the time I was a teenager and I used to sit and watch them roll their balls of dung, just rolling it along. Heaps of them. They worked in packs, breaking up the dung. And I used, used to just get down on my knees and watch. It was just fascinating. Um, and that's probably what the ancient Egyptians did as well. I mean, how can you ignore it? It's quite, quite stunning. The, the beetles would make the balls as 
you know, three, four times bigger than its own body and roll it, sometimes with its front legs, but mostly with its back legs, into a burrow where it would lay its eggs. And then over time, they would hatch out. And that's what the Egyptians thought was rebirth, renewal. And, you know, the fact that it was coming out of these balls, like the sun itself, being reborn each day out of the horizon, it just put it all together. It created their a mythology. It, it, it just hinted at that all the time. It just inspired. It inspired them to create a mythology for it. Not every animal in ancient Egypt had it, had mythological qualities. They couldn't care less about the grasshopper, really. There's no great, great temples to the Lord of the Grasshoppers in Egypt. Yeah. Now, scarabs. Symbol of rebirth, renewal, regeneration. One of the most powerful amulets you could have was a scarab. Now, in life, they were used as a basic talisman, a wish, almost a wish, written or inscribed on the bottom of a scarab. There was also New Year scarabs to commemorate having a good New Year to make the next year even better than the last. And that's one, one I've been meaning to carve for quite some time. I think maybe this is the year I should do it. I can't think of a better year make a new year scarab it's usually a couple of baboons underneath a palm tree with their arms up going yay happy new year everyone Ooh. yeah not that again okay come on back back on track back on track sail up the Nile not on the bank 7,000 years of history for this scarab as an ornamental man-made creation and this goes back to Neolithic times they were quite crude, but the evidence is there that the observation of these amazing little creatures rolling their ball of dung across the ground was like the sun gliding across the sky. And that slowly formed into that mythology. So later on, in a fully developed religion, the scarab was shown riding in a boat, or pushing the boat. Oh, what kind of the boat are you talking about? Horizon, you're waffling on about boats as if everybody knows what you're talking so about. To travel Do you the mean the night boat or the Book day of boat of Ra? The message. That's boat what he's talking about, people. Just forgive him. He knows not what he does. Thanks, Beryl. Sometimes I feel like I'm having a conversation with myself. There were three main type of scarabs put to use by the ancient Egyptians. There were the everyday life scarabs, the wish scarabs, that would have positive messages on them to give them comfort. Certainly there was decorative elements to it, in necklaces and bracelets but the messages on them were generally to uplift and to guard and protect and, and sometimes to pay homage to great pharaohs and therefore gain a little bit of their magic, a little bit of their pharaonic stardust. And also commemorative scarabs, such as those made famous by Amenhotep III. My gosh, he was a busy pharaoh. He was using scarabs, larger ones. I have an example here. I have two examples here. The king was using them as a type of propaganda. He was putting recorded events on them. Not him personally, but certainly under artistic direction. Things that were happening in the kingdom. For a start, his marriage to Queen T was commemorated on a scarab and that was sent to the far lands in the empire. Also, there was a series of lake scarabs, of which this is an example. 
this was made for the commemoration of a lake the king made for Queen T at Charuka. And we even know the name of the boat she sailed into it on. It was the splendor of the Arten. And this was no cattle dam. It was 1,200 feet long. This was a major reservoir of water right near a palace. So they're like the newspapers of the ancient Egyptian world. Well, for this time anyway. So many glyphs could give quite a lot of information. The other type of scarab, of course, is the funerary version. The heart scarab. Most important of the scarabs for the afterlife. They weren't drilled for decoration or, or worn. They were to be placed over the heart of the mummy in case your heart deteriorated and disintegrated to stand in place of it. And it usually had an inscription on the back with spell 30B from the Book of the Dead. And it was to stand by and speak on your behalf for all of the questions that would have been asked as you entered the afterlife. Various deities would be going through your resume. And if you failed, if you'd been a naughty, naughty Egyptian, you would be eaten by Amut, a horrific creature, the great devourer, the body of a, of a leopard, the backside of a hippopotamus, and the head of a crocodile would just eat you alive out of existence forever. There was nothing worse than an, that an Egyptian would fear more than being eaten by Amut. So much so that some of the wealthiest Egyptians would pay priests on their death to talk to the scarabs, the living scarabs. They would talk to them and give the scarabs the answers that would likely be asked by all the various deities. And then they ritualistically kill that scarab, mummify it and put it in the ear. So it could be in there secretly in the mummified body to, uh, to answer and whisper into the, ear, into the head of the deceased all of the secret questions so it could, could pass. Such was the fear of being eaten by Amut. I mean, it's, it's just... It's a beautiful mythology. It makes you... It's almost like a... Uh, how do I put it? It's like the mythology that's, uh, that's in Marvel Comics today. You know, if that was real, they're like, they're like the gods to young kids now. But to the ancient Egyptians, all of the different deities must have seemed like superheroes and villains. That's how you've got to sort of look at that. And these little extra details that they went to to ensure they could pass through to meet Osiris safely. Wow, it's the most complex of afterlife passages you could possibly imagine. It's the most complex of any ancient imaginings. Okay, people, it's time to have a commercial break if you're awake and today we're going to look at the marvellous car from 1936, the Stout Scarab, which I used to drive around when I was doing all of my mutant dog business with my husband, Roger. And they're a marvellous car. They're actually technically the world's first minivan and they're shaped like a scarab and they've got a wonderful, happy, smiling face and a steering wheel and interior of all deco design. The whole thing is a deco symphony on wheels and I hope you enjoy it as much as I will enjoy driving it around in your mind tonight. I'm Beryl Whittaker here with tonight's Down Under Pharaoh advertisement. 
now I've got to go and make myself a nice hot cup of tea and Cameron's ramblings can continue. Thank you. The deity Kepri is shown anthropomorphically as a man's body with the scarab as a head, the whole beetle with its legs open, resting in between his shoulders. It's, it's quite a clunky looking god, uh, but that's, that's it. It's quite stunning and powerful. Kepri never had an actual dedicated temple to him. However, there were some large-scale scarabs, large statues, found within these temples, such as Karnak, and there's one also in the British Museum. Uh, it's quite large. It's, yeah, it's, it must weigh a ton or two. And the one in Karnak is just, it's like as big as a small car, like a gogo mobile or something. It's huge. And it's framed by two uh, obelisks, the last standing obelisks in Karnak, Thutmuza and Juhutimis, and Hatshepsut's uh, obelisk standing not far behind it. So it's quite a good photo op when you get there. Or if you've already been there, you already know that. But yeah, definitely worth seeing. And it's quite surprising to see it there. This whopping great scarab. It's awesome. Now, now let's have a look at a few of the ones in the collection here. Some anomalies, some beauties, and some that I've made a long time ago. Here we see one of the largest that I've made. It's a nice form underneath. A Middle Kingdom type scroll with the Nefer symbol and the Ankh, symbol of life and fertility underneath. This one's currently available, or will be available. Some early ones here. This is one of my 90s scarabs, with a simple protective eye of Horus on it. Nice casing on that one as is on this one here not this one this one's a modern egyptian fantasy this one here is a replica of a pectoral with isis and neptis underneath or on each side of the scarab on the boat that he sails upon. And on the back, Osiris and a scarab spell so that the heart will always speak true. I'd say that's a 19th dynasty piece. This one is too. one here is an unusual human-headed scarab to ensure that the person depicted would be reborn. That's the point of having the human heads on them. They're much rarer, but they're very, very cool. I've only made that one available a couple of times. Coming back. And this one is your typical souvenir from Egypt. Defiance. The hieroglyphs mean virtually nothing. No, they do mean nothing, they're just garbled. Essence of hieroglyph. Same with that mosh. Moshed up mess. Nice, nice shape though. Really not a bad form there. Tiny little ones here. I think that one's been through a camel's butt. And in here is a few. Oh, there's an unfinished one here. I started for 
Queen T. It's a Queen T scarab. And another one of my earlier ones. Middle Kingdom scrolls with an ink. This one I did very recently. This one's going to be part of a collection coming up. It's got Tutankhamun's Carmen's name on it. Neb Keparu. Oh, no, there's Nefra and Netus in there as well. Beautiful god. And what else is this one? Oh, this is an oldie. This one's regularly available. It's a multi protection scarab with the jet pillar of strength of Osiris in the center, surrounded by two. Symmetrical Nefer symbols of beauty, that which is good. The nub single of gold at the top. And the left and right eye of Horus at the ends. Not bad indeed. Anything else in there? No, just rust. Rust and dust. Scarabs. Oh, there's one I made for my nephew. The Jackson Scarab, I call this one. I found, he found a, a stone for me on the beach and I carved it for him. This is a, a copy of the one I made for him. Yeah, it's simple. Something you could skim across the water. It's just a little, a little something to do when on holidays. Hmm. Thank you, Sadie, for minding them. That's okay. Come again next week. Actually, I've got a scarab story I'll quickly tell you. So, yeah, let's do that. When I was first collecting things as a teenager, I mean, there wasn't a lot around. The first time I saw something artistic, something substantial to decorate my room was at a market and it was a pharaoh's head and a pair of sphinxes and it was made of plaster and I just thought it was the most wonderful thing ever because it was my first Egyptian purchase and the guy he was an Egyptian who, who I bought it from and I remember this to this day he gave me a little scarab it was a very crude thing, but it had a little glaze on it, and I've still got it. It's a, it's a little marvel. It was inspiration. I thought no, no one had ever given me any, anything such, so so wonderful. It was a lovely gift, and over the years I've given many scarabs away as part of my ethos. Some of you have already got some of those. I don't do it as much anymore because. Well, it, it got a bit out of hand there. I, I couldn't give everything away. But back 10 years ago, when I started Down Under Pharaoh, the second incarnation of my business, uh, I was giving out some scarabs as a, as a, as a thank you for, for helping me get going again. So... I've made many, many scarabs over the years. And some of the ones I'll show you now are ones that I made in sandstone and others, different kinds of stones, clay and steatite and a whole bunch from Egypt as well. When I was there, I was given many and I certainly bought a few as well. So... Yeah, I had a mystery bag of them as well and they um, on getting them home wow, well, <laughs> there's quite a few odd ones in there of various different manufacture uh, a lot of the modern scarabs these days over there have <laughs> are made from steatite fired and are given a little glaze and that wears off sometimes but there are other ones that are fed to camels and they go through the digestive tract and the acids in the stomach 
give them a nice aged look and um, they come out the back the back end of the camel <laughs> yes and that's how some scarabs are sold hmm one had best hope they'd been washed lest one have a dirty scarab hole scarab Okay, and that's this week's piece of the week. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed recording it for you. And perhaps next week, we might travel somewhere else. What do you think? Hmm. Antarctica sounds nice this time of the year. Thanks for your input, Beryl. But it's not always appreciated. So if you like this video, Please subscribe and hit that ding -a ling bell and that'll give you a notification of when the next item is. It's better than a kick in the head. It's better than a kick in the head. It's better to be bitten on the leg by a scarab that's been living in the bottom of your bed. Yeah! Yeah!